I'm um, happy to uh, introduce our speaker today, Jay Gao, who's, uh, I think, spoken here. We couldn't figure out how many years ago, you know, probably way too many. And uh, we hope she gets to speak here more frequently than that. And uh, just the two words of introduction, Jay uh, started uh, with the PhD at uh, Stanford with Bill Gibbs and was for many years at Sony Brook. And then um, she's now at Rutgers, and uh, I will let her speak. All right. Thanks, Boris. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to talk about a topic that in the beginning part has no geometry in it. But then towards the end, when we really work on the problem, we realize the challenge comes from some geometry. So, um, so there are three parts of the title. So this is differentially private right? on shortest paths. So I guess we know about range theory, we know shortest paths. I would assume that nobody needs to have the background on what differential privacy means. So I'm going to give definition and what that means, like brief small examples to help everyone understand you know, why that is uh, uh, that matters. So okay, classical range query problem that we like. Uh, in geometry, it would be the following type. We have points in the plane. We have some ranges. This could be uh, rectangles. This could be boxes in high dimensional. This could be possible and synthesis. Um, and for different type of ranges, we have different algorithms to answer queries, such as how many points I have inside the range. I want to pre-process the data so that I can answer these queries efficiently. Now. The problem I'm going to look at is again some kind of range query problem, but we care about range query on graph. So let's consider a graph, it's weighted. And on a weighted graph, let's assume we have shortest paths. So imagine this graph to be like Google Map. And we have the weight of the edges so that define shortest paths in a meaningful way. And in addition, let's assume that the edges also carry some additional readings. So this could be, for example, users who report they discover something interesting, like along a road segment, or they discover something um, that requires attention. Um, so this could be readings that are reported from, let's say, mobile devices. And um, what we want is to report along the shortest paths, the summation of the this readings. And this is the range query we care about. I'm going to move this maybe smaller. So the ranges we define as shortest paths on the graph. And then we want to answer a similar type of range query, which is the summation of the readings of the edges on the shortest paths. And for the same thing, we want to pre-process this data and build a data structure so that we can report this uh, readings in a nice way. So there's no weights at the vertices, for example. Uh, for now, no weights no. at the vertices. And also no readings at the vertices. No readings at the vertices. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, we could also consider the readings at vertices, not edges. Yeah. It's uh, similar. But for now, let's say all okay. the readings are at the edges. Right. Now, I'm going to make a few assumptions to make my problem to be uh, you know, better defined. First, I want to assume that the shortest paths are consistent, meaning if you have two shortest paths, if they intersect, they will merge and share some kind of common subpaths and possibly diverge. So in other words, I would not allow shortest paths to meet, diverge, and meet again. Because in that setting, you will have two shortest paths between a pair of vertices. So let's say whenever shortest paths are uniquely defined, or if there's a tie, but you have a way of breaking ties by either like random perturbation or some combinatorial perturbation, then you could define a consistent set of shortest paths. So this is the picture we can imagine that when shortest paths intersect, they will intersect in this manner. And the second assumption, and that is where this uh, privacy problem arrives, is um, 
the readings because they come from, let's say, wearable devices. These are user reports, and they may be sensitive. So we would like to protect these readings with some privacy guarantee. Again, nobody wants you know their report data to be somehow publicly tracked, and therefore we want to protect like you know what the reading is and so on. So I'm going to spend maybe the beginning to to have a quick review of privacy models. Again, this will imply uh, the objective of the, of the problem, and this will also lead to like the solution of the range query for shopping tasks. Okay. All right. So again, differential privacy is one of the popular privacy models um, that they practically talk about what we mean about privacy. So here, let's consider a range query problem. Now, I want to report the answer, but because of privacy protection, my answer will be noisy. So I will add some perturbation to the data. So when I report report the, uh, the value, the value carries some noise, and this noise will hide individual readings or individual input from uh, the contributors. So here, let's assume the following. Suppose I have two adjacent databases, D and D prime, and they're really similar. They differ by, for example, just you know one piece of data, or they differ by like L1 or L1. So they're really similar. And then if I have a range and I'm going to report like range query on the two different data sets, I'm going to get almost the same solution. So the probability that my output from database D and my output from database D prime, I want this to be almost the same. Like the difference is a ratio of D to the power of epsilon for a very small epsilon. So if you imagine epsilon to be almost like zero, then that means if it's precisely zero, it means I'm going to output the same thing. In other words, if you see the output, you will not be able to tell if the real data is D or D prime. So if the difference of D and D prime is just one reading, let's say it's Boris data, then I wouldn't know if Boris data was included in the database or not. Does that make sense? Yeah, all right, very good. So this is called Epsilon differential privacy. And that epsilon is this parameter here. Okay. Now, there is also a slight relaxation of that that has another parameter, delta, basically says I would allow this uh, again the same multiplicative factor e to the epsilon. I would also have another additive probability error of delta. So this is called epsilon delta differential privacy. And when delta is zero, that is, it is only epsilon, we call this pure DP. And in this result, we call it approximate DP. Yeah, this terminology. Okay, now I want to <laughs> mention why this becomes a popular model for privacy. Um, there are a couple of reasons. One reason is that once you have your perturbation in there, and you have your privacy guarantee all calculated, and now you publish your perturbed data, you can do all sorts of processing on it. And this will not damage the uh, privacy protection. So this is a nice property because once I make sure I meet the privacy requirement, I can publish the data and not worry about it. And the second nice property is composition, that is, Suppose I publish the data once with epsilon one, it's called privacy loss. And later I publish the data using a different mechanism with privacy epsilon two. So I publish two perturbed copy of the data separately. Then I know at the end of the day, I have privacy loss to the summation of epsilon one plus epsilon two. So that means you could just sum up this privacy loss 
And this gave you a budget and understanding of how much privacy loss you have had, or you know, if you decide to stop, like not publishing additional data, then you have understanding of how much has been done. Okay. So I'm a little confused. Uh, so are these reports of the same data of the, the without the error in it? The noise. Are these reports about the same data sets? The original data sets are the same? Yes. The same data set, I add noise and publish a noisy version of it. Yes. And this will give me some idea of this data set. Right. And there is this privacy loss of that one. Right. Now, maybe I publish using the true data perturbed using fresh noise independently, publish another copy of it. Yeah. Again, perturbed. Now, with the second copy, I get a bit more information about the original data. Now, there's guarantee that- But the second one is, is obtained from noise added to the original yes. thing. Yes. So why why is the nor why is it, if I know M1 and M2, that it's epsilon one plus epsilon two? I don't get it. Why, why is it sum? Why is the sum? I mean, why wouldn't I get- Yeah. It's actually because we have this is the ratio of the probability. Right. So you have if I have let's say this is a one algorithm, right? Right. And I have another algorithm that use again the true data. Now, what's the chance that you know both algorithms give exactly the same output yeah. for D one and D two? Yeah. And what's the difference of this ratio of the prob of of the prob uh, probability? Yeah. It will basically be you can basically multiply those two ratios and on the right hand side you will have e to the epsilon times another e to the epsilon two yeah and then that epsilon gets added up on the exponent mm -hmm. so basically if i move this term yes. to the left hand side yes i will have a ratio this is for algorithm one yes now if i have algorithm two i have another bound of this ratio mm -hmm. so bounding the you know, multiplication of the two because these are independent uh, fresh noise. And that will give me a upper bound of this ratio e to the power of epsilon one plus epsilon two. It's again, because the way they define this noise curve that gave you that summation. Um, I have a question about, uh, so you said D and D prime uh, differ by L1 norm of one. Could you explain the meaning of this? Yeah. So you could consider this to be, there's, um, you know, the one entry, one, one piece of data being different from D and D prime. In general, we could say, you know, maybe just take L1 norm to measure the difference of D and D prime. So basically, when this was originally defined, they use it for, let's say, hospital uh, patient record. You have one database, you have another database that you keep everybody, but you remove one particular patient. Now, if I end up getting almost the same output, let's say identical output, then that will reveal no information about the particular patient, because I don't even know whether it was there or not. Hope that clarifies. Yeah. Okay. All right. Moving on. So I want to mention like how we add noise. Again, this is basic. Uh, some of the uh, favorite noise perturbation mechanism in differential privacy is Laplace uh, distribution. So let's say I have some value I want to output. I don't want to output the value exactly as it is. I want to output this value plus a another noise. And this noise, I take it from a Laplace distribution. So these are just <coughs> pictures of examples of Laplace distribution. Basically, there's a parameter V, and this parameter you know, decides how sharp or tall the peak is, or how um, flat the distribution is. Okay, and um, let me say, you know, how this is used later on. So basically, we want to introduce noise, and I'll show you in a moment why Laplace 
turns out to be a, 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 a very nice distribution here. But another um, um, factor here is how large is the noise? What's the magnitude of the noise? And this is related to this notion of sensitivity. Okay. Now, the definition for sensitivity is if I'm going to output a function f. Now, sensitivity, which is written as delta f, is the difference in the output between any pair of databases. When I say adjacent, I mean they are almost the same. They differ by L1 norm of 1 and things like that. So basically, if you change a little bit in the database, you want to say what is the change in magnitude of the function. So let me have an example to understand why this is meaningful. So suppose I have the problem of reporting the average employee salary. So I'm not reporting individual salary. So I hope to say, okay, I have privacy, but actually not quite. Because if one of the employee has a very, very high salary, like much higher than everybody else, then average is going to crack like really hot, right? Now, if you imagine another database with everybody else, except the one who gets paid a lot, then the average will change dramatically before and after I remove that um, employee with a high salary. So that means if I look at the average, I can somewhat guess whether that you know, high paying employee was included or not. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Or in other words, if I want to add noise to hide the difference, I need to add noise that is so big to hide the change incurred by including that high paying employee. Yeah, so that is the reason I need to get the sensitivity included into the picture. Okay, all right. So now let me show you one of the mechanisms to get differential privacy. It's called Laplace mechanism. It says the following. So let's take again the average employee salary problem. I'm going to add a noise to it, which is um, taken from Laplace distribution with the parameter to be delta F over epsilon. Delta F is the sensitivity. So if one employee may change it a lot, I need to make my noise to be of bigger magnitude. And this epsilon is going to be this privacy loss. Okay. I will show a like very quick calculation of why this is epsilon DC. But basically, we just plug in the definition for differential privacy. What we want is suppose I have database C. I'm adding a noise. Suppose I'm getting a value X. Now, if I have a database D prime, I'm getting I'm adding another noise Z prime. I'm getting, for example, exactly the same value. Right? What's the chance of that? Now, if I look at the ratio of the probability, I will just need to plug in this probability distribution. This will give me. Now the other things cancel out. It will just be e to the power plug in the Laplace distribution. Turns out to be after manipulation, there is, you know, delta f at the bottom. On top is the difference. But then you apply triangle inequality. You see this is at most one. So the right hand side is bounded by e to the epsilon. So the reason Laplace was used a lot because it just helped to get the mass to work out in a very clean way. All right. Okay. Now let me move on. Okay. So range query. I want to talk about range query again in a simple one-dimensional setting and talk about what differential privacy means over here. And then we'll move on to shortest task problem. So one dimensional range query, we all know about it. We have like sorted numbers 
four points on a line, and I will define my ranges to be intervals. Now, what I do is I will build a binary tree. And then if I have a range, I'm going to use a binary tree to help me to find the answer. Okay. Now, suppose I want to answer this range query, but also have the privacy protection. How do I do it? I'm going to introduce like two simple mechanisms that turns out to be not great, and then a better one. And then we'll see how that goes. First, let's say this is called input perturbation. Basically, it says, let's publish data. And for each piece of data, add independent random Laplace noise. And then I have everything perturbed. So every data has this Laplace one of epsilon. And again, this already gave me epsilon dp because every single piece of data is protected. So I'm all good. And now I will just answer range query as regular range query. My you know, input data gets preserved already. So everything else is going to be post-processing that will not damage privacy. So no problem on that part. Now, the trouble is, what is the error magnitude? So if I answer a query that may have an element in it, I need to you know, add up the independent Laplace noise, and that will be the error introduced in this query. Okay. So for that, we are going to basically use the summation of variables with Laplace distribution and use a tail bound of that. For that, mm -hmm. I'm just writing down this uh, um, lemma, which says if you have some Laplace variable with different parameter bi, and then you add them up, you look at what is the tail. Actually, we have the following. Basically, the magnitude is roughly of this order, which is ignoring that delta thing which is a probability here is square root of summation of the i square. So if I plug in what I had earlier, right, I have each um, data element with Laplace one over epsilon. I have n piece of data, n elements. So I'm going to have like, this is one over epsilon square. I have n of them, I add up. This is getting me <coughs> for the well, epsilon times log of one over delta. Now, ignoring the epsilon and delta, this basically says your noise magnitude scales in the order of square root of n. And that is not great because that is like a polynomial function of n. When your query has a lot of elements in it, your noise also grows in a polynomial scale. Okay. <coughs> All right, so now let's look at another different idea. Okay, question so far. Okay, all right, another idea. Another idea is I'm going to keep my data in a secure database. I'm not going to publish that, but I will allow queries to the secure database. And at every query, I'm going to add a fresh piece of noise. So for every query, I will add a Laplace noise with the fresh noise, fresh random numbers taken. And now I will look at what is a privacy loss. So imagine that I have one piece of data, let's say, you know, this particular employee's salary. So if this person's data is involved in, for example, app queries, then for each query, I'm losing something about this data point. I know something about it. So remember we have this composition. That is, if I answer two queries for the same data point, I'm gonna have actually double the privacy loss of it, right? So if I have n queries that involve the same element, I will have a privacy loss, which is m times epsilon here. 
Or in other words, if I just, again, you know, do the scaling, that means if I want, again, the privacy loss to be small, like epsilon, then I have the query error to go up. And this time it goes up to the number of queries that involve a element. Now, this means if your query are somewhat um, sparse, meaning they don't overlap, they don't cover the same element too many times, then this is okay. Otherwise, it may actually may also be a bad idea. So if I look at the one dimensional range query, oh, okay, sorry. Um, yeah, I don't have that, but, uh, but if you have the one dimensional range query, mm -hmm. there could be an element that's covered in quadratically many intervals. So that means this M could be as large as N square. Again, making this to be a horribly large number. All right. So now I want to show how to do better by combining the input and output motivation. So this is um, developed in like the work um, mentioned there. So basically, let's go back to the range tree. And then what we do is we will add independent noise for each node in the tree. For each node, we have a log class of log n over epsilon. We make it log n because if I look at these uh, nodes in the tree, for any particular element, it's only going to be involved in log n of the ranges mm -hmm. that corresponds to vertices of this range tree. And remember, we had this output perturbation. So if element is only involved in log n of them, I just need to blow out that parameter by log n to make sure I have, again, absolute DP. And now let's see the query error. For any range, what I do is we'll do the same thing as standard range query. We will add up the values of these pre-computed um, output answers. And that means we're going to add up log n many independent Laplace noise, each one taking um, distribution with parameter log n over epsilon. And then again, just do the math. We have log to the power 1.5 n over epsilon. So if you compare this number with everything we had before, you see this is way better. Everything earlier was polynomial in n, and this is log of n. Yeah. So far, so good. Great. Okay. Now I'm going to move on to shortest path. So now I will define my ranges to be shortest path of a graph. And again, I want to get some good bound on error versus privacy. So same thing. We do input perturbation, we do output perturbation, and then we do some combination. So let's say input perturbation. What that means is for each edge, there's some kind of sensitive reading. I will add independent noise of Laplace distribution to each value. And then I will look at the query error. And this is going to be because my shortest path may have up to n edges. I may need to add up that many noise. So this is again order n over epsilon. Um, could still be large. On the other hand, I could also do output perturbation, which means for every shortest pass, for every query, I'm going to get a noise. And this noise, I will scale with y, because y is how many shortest paths involve the same edge. How many shortest paths involve the same edge? Worst case, it could be n squared, right? Imagine you have a bridge, and everybody on the left side go to the right hand side, need to cross the bridge. So you could have y to be as large 
as n squared, that means again, I may have the query error to be very large, like very similar to 1D, and now I want to do better than that. So far, so good? Yeah. Okay. So um, to do that is a little bit more work because I don't have the nice one-dimensional range tree anymore. Now here, these are paths, the shortest paths on the graph. You know, I don't have the dimension, I don't have the ordering, but I'm going to, again, define something as canonical ranges, and then I want to make use of that for a nice combination of the values. So first, I'm going to randomly sample S vertices, and that is a set S. And I'm going to build the shortest path between all pairs in S. Okay. And then I want to look at how these shortest paths intersect. So there are S square shortest paths of my random samples. I will take all of them, look at how they intersect with each other. So for example, I may have a picture that looks like this. Right, so this UV is one shortest path, and I may have other shortest paths that intersect with it. Let's say this blue path has two uh, vertices when these two paths merge and split. And again, the red path will have intersection at two different other vertices. Now, if I look at one particular fixed shortest path UV, in the worst case, I may actually have all the other shortest paths, almost everybody else intersect with it. And that means I may actually partition this path into smaller chunks. And these I will call canonical segments. And how many of them do I have? Because there are a square of shortest paths, I may have up to a square canonical segments. So far, so good? Yeah. All right. Now, that is the preparation. I'm going to argue that these canonical segments will be destroyed, will be edge destroyed. I mean, this is because if they share any edge, they should be partitioned further just by definition. Okay, yeah. Okay, with that, let's use the differential privacy mechanism. So first, I'm going to have two types of noise. I will have just input perturbation for each individual edge value. And I may hit to be log plus two over epsilon because I want this part to have privacy loss of epsilon by two. And I want the other part to have, again, epsilon by two, privacy loss adding up, I have epsilon dt. Okay, so this is one source of noise. The other one is I want to output perturbation. I want output perturbation on these canonical segments. And there is another subclass of two over epsilon. And I could do that because these canonical segments are disjoint. So any edge will only appear in at most one of them. Therefore, there's no additional privacy loss. So this is OK. So in terms of privacy loss, I'm basically having this simple formula like this. You know, sum up, this gave me epsilon dt. And let's look at the noise magnitude. So, um, oh. All right, okay, um, the error analysis. So first of all, I'm going to fix a shortest path TUV from U to V. And I'm going to look at this shortest path. First of all, I will look for the first vertex in S. And because I pick my vertices randomly, 
and I have S of them. So on average, if you think about it, after seeing N over S vertices, I expect to see one vertex from S, one sample from it. Okay, so this part before I see any vertices from S is roughly of length N over S. And the same thing, if I look at the last vertex from S on the shortest path, from the last vertex to V, this segment will be roughly N over S vertices. So for this beginning chunk and the final chunk, I will just add up the independent Laplace noise over there. And for the middle chunk, I will use the canonical segments because these are vertices from S, I already pre-computed all the values for them. Okay. So again, I will plug in my tail bound formula. This gave me this two part will be n over s. And this middle part I have s square because I have possibly up to s square canonical segment. So the last term is just to balance the parameter. So if you balance the parameter by making n over s to be the same as s squared, then you get the error bound to be n to the power of one third. It's still not in the log regime, but it's already way better than before. Yeah. Any questions so far? We're good. Okay. All right. So. I want to mention just in the next two slides that, so for two things, one is that I want to try to improve this further, but to improve that further, I have to move on to the epsilon delta regime to add this other parameter delta for the probability of like additive error. Um, and then I will talk about lower bounds like you know, can we show lower bound like matching this upper bound? And that part is gonna use geometry. Okay. So very quickly, so there are a few modifications of it. First of all, although Laplace distribution gave us this very clear formula, but in practice, actually people use Gaussian error a lot more. And for good reason, because summation of Gaussian is always Gaussian. So they sometimes make it easier. The other good thing is we actually get better bound for using what's called strong compensation. So first of all, if I want epsilon delta dp, I could do a Gaussian distribution. I will choose my variance to be of this magnitude. Again, you will see the sensitivity there. You will see epsilon there and delta there. Okay. And the second thing is. For the simple composition, I'm just adding up the epsilon. Here, if I allow some kind of delta, I could actually get better combination of these parameters. So instead of epsilon times k, if you compose k, top it, here you get epsilon times square root of k by like lumping some terms into that delta part of it. Okay. Now, by using this two, we're able to get the bound to be better. And actually, I will need to do a slightly different algorithm because here I want to use a strong composition. So I want to use the multiple epsilon delta dp so that I can apply this composition. And um, briefly, um, the first part is similar. I will have independent input perturbation for every edge value, the same as before. This time with Gaussian noise though. The second part, the canonical segment, I will do it in a different way. Here, I will again randomly sample edge vertices, but then for each vertex, I will build shortest path tree. And for shortest path tree, I will do heavy light decomposition. So I assume everyone knows heavy light decomposition. That is, you go from the root, you take the, the child that has 
maximum number of descendants, you go there. This is a heavy part, heavy child. And then you keep going, so this will trace down a path that's called heavy path. And we keep doing that, so we're going to have a bunch of heavy paths. And then a property of that is, if you look at a path in this tree, you have a most log in heavy paths and a most log in edges not on the heavy paths. We call that light edges. And that is a good thing because I make sure I don't have too many of them. So what we do is we get the heavy pass, we add the separate Gaussian noise. Again, we choose a parameter properly to make sure we get something nice for my final composition. Okay. And then I'm just going to apply this strong composition to handle the error. So analysis would have the following, almost the same thing as before from um, vertex U to vertex V by look at the shortest path. I will have the beginning chunk and the final chunk not possibly uh, uh, actually, let me see, um, like a slightly different. So if my shortest path is short, then maybe my shortest path doesn't involve any of the samples. Then I'm just going to have like summation of independent Gaussian noise. Now, if my path is long, I will involve a sample vertex for sure. Then I'm going to use the shortest path tree for that. And that means I will have some heavy path involved, some light edges involved. And again, let me just do the strong composition. There's some calculation involved. But then eventually, if you balance parameter, you find out we're getting and to the power of a quarter. But this is only for the approximate speaking for now. That is, I need to have a non-zero delta for the moment. We have another way of getting rid of the delta, but that's a separate thing. Yeah. Okay. All right. Now the question is, can we improve it further or is this already the best bound we can find? Or is there a lower bound that matches this? And for that, actually, this will need some tools from computational geometry. So I will talk about VC dimension discrepancy of the shortest paths. Okay. So typically we talk about them for geometric objects, but we can look at the shortest paths to be like in the form of set theory. So a shortest path would be a set that has the vertices, you know, on the path to be involved in the set or edges to be in the set. And now I can talk about the VC dimension. Okay. I'm gonna assume everyone knows VC dimension because that will involve like five minutes of explaining what that is, but essentially it's complexity of this kind of sets. So if I have undirected graph, VC dimension of shortest paths is actually two because if you have three vertices, you cannot shatter them. You know, two examples. If one vertex stay on the shortest path of the other two, then you cannot single out only U and V, not including W. Okay. Or if W is not on the shortest path, then you don't have a single shortest path that involve all three. So <clears throat> here you're looking at the shortest path as that's a vertex, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. I could also look at edges. Yeah. So for directed graph, this dimension is actually mm -hmm. quick. So if you have directions, you actually can shatter three vertices. You cannot shatter four. That is a, a, a separate argument. Um, for our purpose, we actually look at this notion called primal shatter function for shortest path. It means if I look at a subset A that has S vertices, 
I want to intersect A with every range in my set. And I want to look at how many of sets I get with this intersection. So for Schrodinger's task, it turns out for both undirected graphs and directed graphs, the number of sets you get from this intersection is going to be S squared. And this is because it just is going to be decided by the first one and the last one on the shortest path. That's it. Doesn't matter if the rapid path or under rapid path. It's the same order. Yeah. And now there is actually this connection of primal Schecter function with uh, like differential privacy. This is Mutu and Nikolov. Um, they have the following result that says you have range query, and if you have primal function s to the d, and then you have a epsilon delta dp algorithm, and this is the upper bound for now, and this is m to the power of the exponent. If you plug in the values for d to be two, this is actually one quarter on the exponent. <laughs> But this is for M, where M is the size of the graph set. So that means if I'm looking at edges carrying values, now M is the number of edges. If I have vertices carrying values, so this probably does make a difference for this particular result. If I have vertices, I get N to the quarter. If I have edges, this one gives us M to the quarter. For this graph, that is actually giving me roughly, and you know, square root of it. Yeah. So in some sense, uh, like our results improve this, and also using cleaner, uh, like more algorithmic uh, construction of that. And now I want to talk about lower bound. Okay. So for lower bound, this is related to this topic of discrepancy of shorter paths. So let's say I want to assign colors plus one or minus one to either vertices or edges. I can talk about vertices or edges to separate system. And I want to look at the summation of these colors along a shorter path. And I want to minimize the largest magnitude. I want these colors to be as balanced as possible. So that is called discrepancy of the system. So in this earlier work, recent work, it says discrepancy, or actually have a disparate discrepancy, if you know about that, like this difference, is a lower bound of the approximate error. And then what is the best known discrepancy bound for shortest path coloring? It's actually n to the power of one six from the coin line system. So <laughs> that's the application. So basically, this is one of the lower bounds we know in the literature. Basically, we know this is the famous coin line system that wants to have a lot of lines going through a lot of points or coins staying on a lot of lines. Basically, you could have n point and n line where each point stays on n to the one third uh, lines, and each line goes through n to the one third points. Okay. And now, if you make this point line system to be a graph, naturally you say for each edge or each segment, I gave it the weight to be Euclidean length, Euclidean distance. That means if you look at the straight line, this is definitely the shortest path just by geometry. And now you have a shortest path system. And then this point line discrepancy is actually the discrepancy of the shortest path system defined this way. So the same lower bound carries through for shortest path. And very recently, we have improvement for shortest path lower bound. 
we have to move away from this line system by defining some other shortest path, but we're able to get n to the power of one quarter for discrepancy lower bound. So this, if you compare with upper bound we had earlier, would give us tight bound. That means n to the quarter is the best you can do, and there's a matching lower bound. Questions? Where is this? Where is this end to the one quarter coming from? It's a uh, like this is coming from like trace bound mm -hmm. for discrepancy. Now again, we will need to use trace bound, but it's coming from uh one of the construction of shortest paths that was originally for a completely different purpose. But basically, you want like more overlap of this shortest path. Yeah. And, and that, you know, like a very careful design of that will give us, like go through the trace bound calculation given this one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, questions. So this is my last slide. So just want to say, uh, joint work with like students, uh, Changyue and Chen from Rutgers and colleague Jaylaj from Rutgers. And also in particular, this lower bound is joint work with people from Michigan, Greg and Gary. And um, actually this construction is their design. And, um, you know, we, you know, if you apply the trace bound on, you know, this construction, you get into the quarter lower bound. That you know, basically says, you know, there's, we cannot do better than that.